all of my videos, this has got to be one of the hardest. I wasn't even certain I had the fortitude to make it at all. However, after watching Benet Brown's talk on the power of vulnerability, I feel I at least have to try. Despite all the pain my other issues have caused me, loneliness, both as an active force and a pervasive feeling, has caused me more hurt, I think, than anything else. When someone is physically sick, it is the standard procedure to isolate them to prevent them from getting others sick. This is first expected by the person who is sick, that they should isolate themselves from the general group. And if they refuse to comply, well, if they're particularly contagious, the group will isolate them anyway by staying away or locking them away. When you have a mental illness, this still occurs, though it's not because you're physically infectious, it's because you're socially infectious. For me, I did not start out isolated. My mother was the eldest child of her family, the first to get married, the first to have children of her own, and I was the first to arrive, so I got the full familial love and attention right from the start. And then there's the fact that the first two or three years of my life I was living with my parents in a college dorm apartments that were for women only. My father earned money by doing the maintenance, so if my mother ever needed a break, there were always hordes of young women willing to take the baby. Ironically, I have no memory of any of this. My very first memories are, in fact, when isolation first entered my life, when I started preschool and was put together with my peers. Very quickly, I was isolated by my peers because of unacceptable social behaviors and disciplined by my structured instructors because of those behaviors. At home, the kids in my neighborhood seemed to feel that I was only there for their amusement. If they weren't feeling like being playful, well, I was to be belittled and discarded, and that was their entertainment. At this point, around six or seven years old, I had my first meltdown due to my isolation. I remember it very clearly was sitting on my mother's bed while she was holding me. And I was sobbing my eyes out, and I cried out, nobody loves me, everybody hates me. Now, given the fact that my mother was holding me, I knew that wasn't true, but it was a true statement of how I felt. That memory of that moment continued to haunt me for decades. It was an avatar of sorts, my own personal perception of myself. Inside me there was always a little boy crying, feeling isolated and alone. Over time I grew to an acceptance of this. My isolation and being lonely was something I just identified as being part of who I was. As such, I would take actions that would reinforce my identity and develop behaviors that would shield me from the pain of loneliness. If something threatened to draw me out of what was now my comfort zone, I would typically react by doing something socially unacceptable that would result in rejection and isolation. Once isolated, I would then nurse the pain of my loneliness by indulging in addictive behaviors that would numb the pain of feeling alone. This led to various facets of loneliness, all of which I intend to describe. Growing up, I have had friendships, but only though very few that I would consider real friendships. Most of the people that I was around were those people that were accepting of my mental oddities and issues. Still, I don't ever feel I was a particularly great friend. In some ways, I still don't. Half the time, I feel I'm only engaging because I'm socially starving. Despite the fact that 
isolation where is where I felt the most comfortable cutting myself completely off from other people would start to erode my sanity. So I had to make friends and keep in contact with people just to avoid my mental deteriorating decline. I spent my early childhood and elementary years were sort of a mishmash of engaging and separating, engaging and separating. And as I moved into my teenage years and early adulthood, the advent of the internet came into existence and I learned to discover what a chat room was and online games. And that is where most of my social contact came from. How long has it been since you've touched someone? And I'm not talking an accidental bump but a deliberate physical connection. Hours, maybe it was yesterday. Perhaps it happens to you so frequently you just can't remember. It's just part of your daily routine. If so, I'm not entirely sure what would it mean to you if I told you I've gone over a year without coming into physical contact with anyone. That over the last 10 years, if you minus handshakes, the occasional obligatory hug, random collisions, impersonal training, like for a first aid class, I can probably list off every single person I've touched or been touched by. And that number would be less than 30. And the 10 years previous, even prior to that, even less. In psychology, there is something known as touch or skin hunger. <coughs> which refers to people without a lot of physical contact. It was influenced by people who were put in solitary confinement, in prisons, and the terrible things that occurred to these people because of such isolation. Well, for a good six or seven years in my early 20s, that occurred to me, only I didn't need to go into prison. Other than going to the store and buying food and playing online games, I cut myself from all human contact. I imprisoned myself. So while I have slowly started reaching out since then, I know I am still starving for touch affection. Now part of this starvation comes from my difficulties with OCD phobias. Everybody's contaminated. But for me, the big issues are the autism that interferes with the sensory issues and understanding social nuances. And last of all, there is just simply the fact that I'm a man. A big one. You can't tell on camera, I'm six foot four, two hundred and something pounds. I'm not gonna say how much. Making physical contact with other people for any reason in society is becoming more and more dangerous. You don't have to have psychological disabilities to get in trouble for touching someone, even if it isn't sexual. The other part is that I've been starving for so long, physical contact, while it is something I want, is something kind of foreign to me at this point. I can't exactly have physical contact with anyone, even have them sit down close to me without feeling awkward on some level. This is naturally compounded by the fact that over the teenage years in which I would normally be able to learn to engage like this is the time I would make the mistakes because that's typically when people make mistakes is when they're teenagers because everyone else is making mistakes. It's, it's okay. Well, that's kind of gone. I'm an adult and I'm supposed to have all my proper boundaries in place already installed and secured. So I don't have excuses just based on my age. So imagine someone who's been hungry his entire life and they've been given a pile of candies and then they're told that they can eat all of them if they're eating the right way. But they're never told what the rules are for eating them the right way. The person is told that they're eat, if they eat just one of them the wrong way, they may never get to eat another one ever again. So I sit in terrified apprehension constantly unwilling to reach out to the fear of making mistakes 
but still hungry all the time. Sometimes, though, my hunger still gets the best of me. You can only starve for so long. There have been stories of those who have survived prison camps come back to normal way of life only to suffer sudden panic attacks because they remember what it was like to be starving and savagely attack food in a grocery store or something. Their starvation is so... the memory of their starvation is so strong that it overrides their rational thinking. While my rational thinking has never been so compromised that I can state with a surety I didn't know what I was doing, I do know I have acted with very poor judgment from time to time, and in so doing, scared or creeped people out, or made them feel uncomfortable. Their negative reaction to me, even when it was totally justified, only reinforces in my mind that no social contact is worth hurting somebody else. And I go back to starving, with an oath that I will never eat again, right up until I'm compromised by the fact that I'm starving. Actually hurting from being lonely, you seek to find something, anything to numb those feelings, to lower that feeling of starvation, to make you forget. And while there are many things that offer the idea of a temporary relief, what I became addicted to was porn and masturbation. Attempting to use porn to satisfy or numb the need for companionship is a little weird. It's on the surface, porn shows you what you think you want, only to deny it to you by making you further isolated from the possibility of it ever filling that need in reality. Over time, you become addicted, and any display of affection will trigger a craving response to porn to numb the feelings of your envy and the sharp reminder of the pain that you had hoped you had forgotten. This deviant pairing of something that if used in the right way leads to greater bonding is now being used to put even greater distance between you and others and starts to permeate your thinking in every way. Eventually, every form of connection is automatically sexualized and every pure and healthy aspect is marked for destruction to prevent it from hurting you. This is sort of complicated, I know. The best example I have right now of this is based on the two rules of the internet that I found. There's rule 34. If it exists, there is porn of it. And the rule 43. The more innocent and pure something is, the more satisfying it is to corrupt it. Let's start with Rule 34. Why do people have to sexualize everything? One might claim it's simple teenage hormones, but given the number of dirty old men, that just doesn't quite add up. Pervasive in minds and in language is this general need to see porn in every connection. Even things that aren't naturally sexual, like trees and microchips and lawn chairs. There's this website called Rule 34, where there's a pornographic display of just about everything that's been televised in the last 20 years in America. In dealing with my addiction, I've been to that website many times, as well as others, and I have noticed this trend. While popularity is a contributing factor to there being a lot of porn of something, as well as the physical attractiveness of the characters, there is another factor that I have noticed that's not talked about or not noticed. And that is kind of where, real, where Rule 43 comes in. 
If there's any affection, even the slightest trace of warmth or feeling or connectedness between two characters, the amount of porn requested and created for that pairing skyrockets. There is this desperate need to destroy, reduce, and corrupt any possible relationship open to being displayed. It's not just fictional relationships, but the very concept of relationship is under attack as well. The families are destroyed by the weight of incest porn. Children who are naturally loving and affectionate to everyone are poisoned by the, the onslaught of pedophilia and jailbait porn. Male relationships can't ever escape the elephant of homosexual and what might just be a simple desire to bond is flooded with pornographic references and innuendo. The only answer I can see as to why this is happens is there is this deep need that goes beyond reason to destroy affection and connection. Since these things have been shown time and again to not only be necessary to live, but also as our identity as human beings. There are those that might say that this is just fantasy, that just because I indulge in sexual thoughts and activities that minifies human worth and connection, it doesn't mean that I see other people this way in real life. Well, personally, I think that's a delusion because I know it affects me in real life. Recall how I discussed earlier about being physically starving for affection? Well, even after getting past all my psychological aversions, I still have the difficulty of touching people or being close enough to touch them. One of those difficulties is there is this peace in my mind that automatically triggers these sexualized defense mechanisms. I live with this constant horrible shame and disgust with myself that there is some part of me that wants to destroy every good thing that comes into my life by sexualizing it. And any prolonged contact with any person becomes a battlefield in my mind. One side of that desperately wants to fill that hunger with something good. And the other wants nothing more to destroy that which is reminding me of how much pain I'm in. So whenever I consider doing something that can end my loneliness to break out of this cycle, like dating, this paradox of thought is the first big problem. How can I justify meeting people with the purpose of having a relationship when I know my very first impulse will be to mentally dehumanize them if they get too close? Even if I could restrain myself, I still have to face the fact that my starvation for affection will compromise my judgment every step of the way, placing my needs before someone else's comfort. I've already had this happen two or three times, years apart, Every time my control fails, people get scared and I get hurt. So, I maintain my loneliness. I, and because I'm lonely, I remain in pain. And that pain eventually erodes my self-control and I go right back to porn and masturbation again. The psycho, however, didn't start up all on its own. Loneliness, masturbation, porn, pain, all mixed up. It's just started out being lonely. The original reasons for why I felt lonely are still there. My autism keeps me reluctant and insecure. My OCD keeps me paranoid. My attention deficit disorder ensures I'm impulsively distracted. My depression is always there. Always there to remind me of how helpless I am. Aside from having my self-esteem shot to pieces on a regular basis, although I have made a lot of improvements lately, there is still the simple fact that I wouldn't date me. I feel I'm far too unstable for a relationship, and if someone felt they could look past all of this anyway, I'd 
question their sanity a little. Which would make me wonder, would I want to be in a relationship with someone who was crazy? Another big reason that I have a problem with dating is the fact that I'm Mormon. And despite all the Christian doctrine to the contrary that nobody's perfect and we all need help, there's this pervasive theme that everyone should shoot for the very best when choosing a lifelong mate. So, growing up I was programmed to shoot for the very best and to be the very best. Well, I've never felt worthy of the former, and I will never be worthy of the latter. Yet, it's very deflating to know that if I did get into a relationship, it would only be because neither of us could have done any better. Now, I'm not criticizing my religion, despite this added weight to my socialization. I have gained a great deal from structure, organized Christian religion that I'm in. It it's very important to me. It has kept keep me sane through some of the worst periods and the darkest paths my issues would have taken me down like criminal apathy and suicide. I'm not hopeless. Every year, I evolve just a little bit more. Maybe one day I will find the light at the end of the tunnel. I just hope I'm not in my 50s or 60s when I get there.